move on to new topics. Um, so we, we talked about the site system goals here um, a little bit right before lunch. And a couple more things I want to hit before we jump back into more demos. Um, somebody was asking me during lunchtime about distribution points and a couple other things on them. Um, we do have another capability that's kind of a carryover from the ConsigNet 2007 days. And if you know on a branch DP, which we don't have anymore, but you used to have the ability of um, pre-staging DP, uh, branch DPs. So you can take the SMS, PKG, C dollar sign share from a real DP, you can copy that, copy it down, send it to a branch DP and set it as a pre-staged one, and then it will send up stakes saying, hey, yeah, I've got that time that you wanted. So you can do the same thing for real DPs now for Big Man 2012. Uh, we have, you don't copy that type format. I'll show you the UI here momentarily. But we do have the ability of pre staging distribution points. So if you had a scenario where you had a, um, let's say, here's your headquarters, you have your primary site, and DP, and you are your staging here. And you're going to put a DP down here in your small location, but you build it up here. You can go ahead and um, build the DP if you wanted to up here. And you can actually do a, it's kind of like an export and import. And then import on your DP and copy the files to this DP off your network without configuring that having to push them across the wire or this guy being a full DP, which you can have a board for you now. But you could uh, create what we call pre staging content files. Just copy them down here, you run an extract utility. And it's very much like doing this thing with the red DPs here. You get the code down there through USB stick or external drive or CD, whatever it is, and they, some lower level admin would just go ahead and stick it in there and run the utility and bingo. It would punch all your content in their content library now as you see the uh, content live. And I apologize for my handwriting, that's as good as it gets. But as you see the content live, and this is a push push across the wire or the download of it. So again, you stage that number uh, down with um, things that you have going on. And then one more thing I want to talk about before I um, put the screen back down and dim the lights. Another new capability we just added to Service Pack 1. Um, we, the, the Cloud DP we had in there in beta, um, the Pull DP we didn't have in beta. It was something that really got added into the release candidate build, which you guys didn't have access to, but for our customers. And um, we added this other new feature to really late product, and it's not been really advertised yet. And it's called Wake Up Proxy. So Wake Up Proxy. So what Wake Up Proxy would be is you got your primary site server on a subnet, router, subnet, router, and so on. And you have clients sitting out here on these on these subnets. And you want to use Wake on LAN. So you want to implement Wake on LAN technology to go ahead and wake up clients at night so you can do your distributions and have, hopefully, good success of waking up clients and getting content deployed after one of those patches or software distribution. Well, the problem with Wake on LAN, obviously, is that um, generally you want to do a subnet directed broadcast, but then you have to configure your routers to pass those broadcasts, which no of your network guys want to do that. They don't want you doing that. So then your <coughs> Wake on LAN has some limitations to it. So what we add in the service pack one is this feature called Wake Up Proxy. When you enable it, what we do is we pick three computers on each subnet to be wake-up guardians. So what, I'll take this subnet. So if this computer is online, everything's great. Um, you do wake-up packet, he's online, he'll get it, he, bingo, he gets this, whatever distribution is. But let's say this guy goes to sleep. He obviously can't get wake-up packets anymore. So what the guardian will do, it'll detect that that computer has gone to sleep, and he'll basically acquire his MAC address. So now when your site server says, hey, here's a magic packet, and sends that out, it'll, this guy will intercept it for the sleeping client, say, I know he's asleep, I'll take his packet, we'll basically then wake him up, and then give him that magic packet to, to go ahead and, hey, um, here's what you're sure how you're supposed to do, and so on. So basically, we keep three computers on each subnet as guardians to wake up sleeping computers who need to be woken up by waking online on traffic. So it's a, it can be a cool technology to help you get higher penetration of deployments after hours in a scenario where you are implementing some sort of power management when you go to sleep. Um, I'll show you how to implement this in just a moment. Um, but caveats, 
you need to be aware of is that when we acquire this MAC address, um, you may have bells and whistles and alarms being thrown off in your network monitoring tools. So if you have, guys have network monitoring tools that are out there monitoring your networks, um, you could have issues. So we tested this out with our CAP customers um, between the beta and the RQM and the product. Uh, one of my CAP customers actually had a problem with it. They're, um, the day after they turned on Wake Up Proxy, their network um, guys um, raised the sink saying, hey, hey, we got something going on here. Um, and they call it Mac Flap. The Mac address is being moving between physical computers. And their network monitoring tools caught that and, and it gets raised all of some alarm stuff. Um, so that's one issue you might have if you have network monitoring tools that are monitoring this type of scenario on your network. The other thing is one of our other CAP customers had um, uh, I think it was 802.1x um, port authentication enabled. And when this happened, the network tools went ahead and shut down those ports, um, which obviously is not a good thing. So if you have an environment where you have to type in monitoring tools or a port authentication turned on, the wake up proxy may not work for you. But uh, just want you to be aware of it because it is actually very cool technology. We're working to make it more effective for you. And to try and get less of the map floppy type thing so that your network monitoring tools won't detect those issues. So just real quickly how you would enable this feature, you go to your administration node, your workspace, you go to site configuration, go to sites. Um, first thing you would do is go and enable wake up proxy. Or excuse me, you go wake, enable wake up land, wake on land. You go to wake on land, and you go ahead and say enable it, and then you have it configured for a unicast. So do a unicast. Uh, oops, that's not the rectangle. So do a unicast as opposed to subnet direct broadcast. So go configure wake on land as you need it to be done. Then you go to client settings, and you may not want this for all your clients. You can pick and choose, but um, I'll just use default. Go to properties. Go to power management. And in the RTM code, power management has these two options here. Allow power management of devices and allow end users to opt out of power management to exclude their computer from it. So, oops. Uh, sure I can. Um, uh, there we go. Okay. Look at this technology. Thank you. I wasn't looking over there, so sorry about that. You said something earlier. Uh, so those two highlighted were the ones that were in RPM code. What we've added in SP1 now is the bottom half of this, which is for wake-up proxy. So if you do want to use this wake-up proxy thing, then what you do is you go down and enable wake on LAN, as I showed you, or half of you got to see <laughs> this side of the room. I've uh, got to see. And then you go down to enable wake-up proxy, say yes. We pop up a big message box saying, Hey, buddy, make sure you read the product documentation so you know what the ramifications are of enabling this thing. Uh, now, it would be really good if we had some product doc documentation that would give you the ramifications of this thing, but it's, it's coming. Um, I'm not sure it's there today, but very, very shortly it'll be up there. And that's basically talking about the Mac flap stuff and the port authentication. And they'll give you some more of the behind the scenes, hey, here's how this thing works. Um, uh, I don't think they're going to tell you the algorithm we use to pick the guardians and stuff, but um, give you some more information about it. So anyway, you go ahead and say, okay, yeah, I understand that. And then you get to specify the port you want to use, and there's a default where you proxy port to use. You can configure that if you want to, and you wake on land port. If you need to open a firewall, you can go ahead and configure the firewall to open this up on clients so you can have, they can receive the uh, wake up packets and, and the proxy and so on. So you go ahead and configure that as necessary. Then all you do is when you have something you want to deploy, um, I don't think this image yet has anything um, to deploy. Uh, oh, okay, I'll take this package. I'll take this package. Uh, it's not going to let me deploy because there's no program for it. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go ahead and do this. We'll just create one real quick. And file, and now we'll go ahead and say deploy, and I'll go to the collection of clients, and there isn't any, 
And now, on your deployment, you just go ahead and select the option for send wake up packets. So that's it. I want to do wake on land for this deployment. That will then utilize the wake up proxy scenario to go ahead and wake up clients that are um, in the target collection when they're targeted with this uh, with this deployment if they're asleep. So you enable wake on land, you enable wake up proxy, you then configure your deployment to send wake up packets, and the whole thing works together, and hopefully you don't get in trouble through your network guys. So. Um, I know we're working on, again, reducing some of the Mac flat stuff and the number of iterations and stuff that we do that make things better. Um, one of the Microsoft sites um, had a, has a problem with this as well, so they, they're working on, again, reducing it, they're testing out that site to see if it passes their criteria, so then we'll go from there to see if it works right. So, But it's a great scenario. Um, now, back to the other thing I wanted to talk about was the create pre state content file. So I have this package here, and if I wanted to get that package, um, now to a distribution point, and I don't want to push it across the wire or have it pulled across the wire, I can go ahead and do this create pre-state content file. And in this case, it's not giving me that action because when I created that package, I didn't give it any source files. Um, so there's nothing for it to pre-stage. But I just click that option, and it lets me take my package source file, it basically zips them up into a PKGX file. I take that PKGX file, Get it down to that DP through, again, a thumb drive or DVD or whatever it is, and then run a utility called Extract Content, and it will go and extract from that pre stage content file and put it out there like it was a pull DP got it or a push DP received it. Um, so very cool. And you can put multiple different pieces of content in that same package file if you want to. You have multiple different types of content in there and, and get them all down in one, one bundle. So that can help you, again, save that number of traffic going across your wire. No scenarios. Okay. Can you multi-select packages and create create it all at once? You can multi-select and do creation. Yes. Uh, and then you browse from your uh, source, uh, create the file you want to. Uh, see colon backslash. And then here's the two different packages you want for content and what source DP you want to pull from, and then go from there. Yeah, you can multiply button. Oops, escape, and yes. Okay, um, so that's that's primarily the, the infrastructure changes. <coughs> One other thing before we move on um, that's changing the infrastructure for you, and that is if you, and I guess not that many of you did, but um, in the System Center Universe, we covered this in the slides, that in RTM, if you wanted to have a hierarchy, you had to install your CAS first, and then install your primary site after that. And of course, you could always install secondary sites whenever you wanted to um, after primary. But you had to go in this order, a CAS first, then a primary, and then a secondary site below that. And if you wanted to add another primary site, it would be any time in here after number one. So it could be number 2A if you wanted to. So what would happen is you have to make some determination as to did I need to have more than one primary site in a hierarchy from the very beginning? Because you had to install your CAS first. And when you install a primary, you said, I'm standalone or I'm attaching to a CAS. Now with service pack one, you can take a primary site, install it first, that's all I need. All I need is a standalone primary. The vast majority of our customers can go ahead and get by with a single primary site, generally it's 100,000 clients, and most people don't have that many. So you're fine with that. But now, let's say I, I, I grow rapidly, or I expand now, I'm going to start managing Macintoshes, which we support in SP1, that increase the number of client counts or whatever. So I do decide to need more than one primary site. So I want to have another primary site over here. So now you can go ahead and install a CAS, Retroactively, so you don't have to install your client access or client system um, uh, administration site first. You can go ahead and install your standalone primary, and now if you need it, you can create a CAS and attach it to one single primary site. So I can attach it at one time at the site attached for one primary site. That will be just like we did the scenario over here, where a CAS is first and primary site second. I just reverse the order. <clears throat> now I can go ahead and install a new primary site under there. And then I can add secondary sites, more primary sites, and so on. 
but it does give you the flexibility of starting small, starting with a single primary, and that primary can have secondary flow as well. That's fine. And then creating a hierarchy out of that. And then as you saw, if I had a scenario where I had two primary sites, they were both standalone. So I had two standalone primary sites, uh, and now I need to create a hierarchy. Let's say it's company one, and then you merge with company two or acquire them, and you want to keep both those primary sites, but you want to create a hierarchy out of them. You can't do that directly. So now you can create a CAS, attach it to whichever site is your bigger site of the two, <coughs> more objects. Then you go ahead and do migration. So migrate just like I did the demo. I migrate the objects from the smaller of the two sites over to your hierarchy, and really the migration goes up the cast, which is for a purpose here. I'm going to here. So migrate those objects over to your hierarchy. Then you uninstall that primary site as a standalone site. You reinstall it as a primary site in the hierarchy. There's no, you can't attach to this one. You already did one site attached to one single site attached. So you have to uninstall it, migrate, uninstall, reinstall in the hierarchy, and then you'll get all the objects back from normal site data or global data replication. So it'll be just like you did the attach process in there, but um, just with an uninstall and reinstall process as part of that. So it gives you a little more flexibility in your in your hierarchy now with, with service pack one. Um, so a, a lot of times, specific consulting firms, uh, I won't name names, but their initials might be MCL, would go out there and make you install a CAS, even if you'll need to stand on primary, if they call it feature-proofing your hierarchy. We don't know if in the future you not, might need to go to one, so we're going to make you prepare you for that from the beginning. So they make you install a CAS, and then install your one primary site, and that may be all you ever use, but just because the fact that you couldn't accommodate, they would give you that right now. So it could cost you extra hardware, extra Windows license, extra SQL Server license, extra config man license for something you wouldn't need, necessarily need. Imagine <coughs> start with what you need, and if you have to, then you go ahead and expand out. It gives you much more flexibility. Okay. Any questions on that before I move on? All right. So let's jump into some of the SP1 client features. So we told you how to get from 2007 to SP1. We told you how to get from RPM to SP1. Now let's go ahead and some of the new site system roles. Let's go ahead and jump into here and um, do some work. So what we're going to do is uh, to show the real-time actions really cool, we're going to go ahead and implement infant protection. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to Asset and Compliance, uh, verify my client's communicating. Yes, it's, it's active. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and create an infant protection policy, or use the default one. And I'm going to go ahead and set my definition updates. In my case, I'm just going to use file share because I'm not on the network, so I'm going to do file share for my definition source. And my source is going to be oops, primary one EP old. Make sure it's spelled correctly before I primary one EP old. That's really why I zoom it. I can't see all that. Uh, so I zoom in and uh, do I think. So I'll say that's where I want to get my definition files. Okay. So I'll configure that. Now I have to install the endpoint protection point site system role. It's a brand new role you need in Big Man 2012 if you want input endpoint protection. It's back in administration, servers and site system roles. I'm just going to add it onto my site server. It doesn't have to be on your site server. I'm going to go ahead and add it there. So I'll go to home, add site system roles. And for later demos, I'm also going to want the application catalog, so I'm going to go ahead and install the application catalog roles right now, as well as endpoint protection. So those are the three new roles that we have in SP1. There it pops up and says, hey, if you do endpoint protection, you We have next. This is for my application catalog. I'll take the default ports and websites, and I'll say this is Houston area SMUG. And Houston, you're going to be pink. Sorry, I wouldn't offend anybody, but I have two girls, so we'll go pink. 
uh, and then you have to accept the EULA. This is for input protection. That's all there is for, input, for the catalog. For input protection, you have to accept the EULA, and then you have to say, how do you want to join the Microsoft Active Protection Service, or do you want to? It's both as a basic membership. What this service does is it allows your clients to send information about your applications up to Microsoft. And the reason for that is so we can create definitions so we know what your application looks like so we don't block your application from running thinking it's a virus or malware. So the more, so that's the basic membership and then advanced just gives us more information like signatures about your app so we get better, easy, easier to define what your app looks like. And if you don't want to do that, you can say don't join maps at all. But I'm in a disconnect environment. It doesn't really matter what I say. You can change this um, after the fact once you make your determination or you analyze, oh, yeah, it doesn't really um, send anything that I don't really want up there to Microsoft. Okay, so go ahead and install those roles. Um, so what, what happens with the endpoint protection role is on the computer you enable the role on, it actually installs the endpoint protection client agent. So if it's gotten that far, which it hasn't yet, uh, we'll see the endpoint protection client agent will appear here. Uh, it's, I'm installing the application catalog roles there as well. So you would see uh, right below that. It keeps moving on me. It's somewhere in here. You saw it. Uh, it's gone now. It's got to install. So it should be installed now. Yeah, so there's the endpoint protection client agent installed. It's a mini version of the client agent just for doing some mapping of, of software. Just trying to find the definition. So we install that on the computer that you make the endpoint protection point site system role. So you have to do that to be able to manage endpoint protection through configuration manager. So now I want to get the endpoint protection agent on my client computer. So there you go to client settings. I'm going to go to default, but you can create custom settings if you wanted to. Properties, go to endpoint protection, and you have a whole bunch of options here to configure. First thing obviously is you got to change this from a no to a yes. Manage the endpoint protection on clients. I want to say yes to that. So I'll turn that yes and everything else becomes available to me once I say yes, I do want to manage. Uh, install it on client computers. Yes. Um, do you want to automatically uninstall third party? Is there a prerequisite? Uh, pre there is one hotfix. Uh, one. <coughs> There was a hot fix you had to apply for endpoint protection. It was specific SD1. Is that network, uh, network inclusion NIN? Well, there's network inspection service. That comes part of endpoint protection. But there's a hot fix. I have it on my, I can tell you the hot fix number. Uh, so I have it downloaded here. It is 9818889. That's the hot fix you'd have to add. And I don't have Zoom, but I'm a local laptop, so I can't zoom in for you. That's the hot fix to, uh, for endpoint protection. So if you don't install that, we'll install it as part of our um, as part of our client install process, and then it reboots your client. So you might want to pre-deploy that. Um, I install third-party products. Um, commit this to um, uh, Windows embedded systems, which we have some good support for now. And suppress restarts, which by default is yes. So your input protection would not be active yet, and I'll show you how you can validate that later on. But I need to change the bottom one. The bottom one says disable sources such as file shares, and the answer is yes. I want to change that to no. I don't want to disable that. I want to change it so I can get sources from non-configuration manager sources. So click that, and that creates policy. That creates policy for my client. So I'll go ahead and tell my client to go ahead and pull policies. So I go to my client, go over here to control panel, configuration manager, Go ahead and say action, machine policy retrieval and evaluation cycle, click run now. If I didn't do it too quickly, which I normally would look, um, then we'll see almost immediately here, we'll see skep install running. This should hop in right there if I didn't do it, pull it too quickly, and I may have pulled it too quickly. Usually I look at my policy provider log file to make sure I um, have waited long enough, and I'm guessing I pulled policy before the log file was done. Um, so just for reference, what you want to do is on your site server, and in real in real time, you guys are forcing things to happen on your clients like this. You're creating things and telling them, hey, I do it overnight or whatever. We're just in a short time frame scenario. So uh, up and then, call the provider, 
you can see it just updated. Uh, it's in fact, it just updated 1130, uh, which is 130 here. So it just did update, so I pull policy too soon. <coughs> go back over to my client computer, and we call the pull policies again. Now I'll show you, I'll show you how you can overcome this um, momentarily. And notice this is a service type one client, 7804-1000. Now we see Skep installs running. It keeps moving around on me, so I'm not going to be able to catch it, but it's, it's in there running. Uh, it's gone already. But you can see uh, there's the agent running. So that's the enter protection agent running. And we can tell that by going here, and there's the client's installed. And it's right now searching for its definition. So that policy will get the every protection client agent installed on all my computers. So I want to go ahead and force it on my site server as well, because the site server had a, a mini version of the client, didn't have a fully functioning client on it. So go ahead and tell it to go ahead and install policies. <coughs> and then that will go ahead and install the full endpoint protection client agent on my site server computer. Okay, so we have that. And that's going to go ahead and install the client. Well, my definition file is really old. So when this does get installed on my client, it should say that my definition file is like 156 days old. Uh, which obviously is, you guys would be shot if you were managing something that old. But in my VM, that's when I snap the images and so on. And um, I was thinking about downloading new images and saving them here, but it gets the point across. I'm going to go ahead, and i got newer policies here, newer definitions, so I'm going to go create a custom policy. And so I'll go create custom anti-malware policy. I'm not very creative, so I'll just say custom. And I want to change my scheduled scan as well as my definition update source. No, we should have the latest um, update package with installation definitions. Yeah, the Cell Configuration Manager is good for you. So if you have integration with software update points, the software update automatically downloads that. And but when you, not, when you deploy it for the first time? It, it'll pull from Configuration Manager. So if you have already integrated that with Configuration Manager with the automatic deployment rule to have those updates there, it'll be on your DP. We install the client. It's going to go ahead and pull those definitions immediately. So you will get the current ones. So our default for scanning is Saturdays at 2 a.m., as you can see here. Just to show you that the policy will work for what I'm going to do, I'm going to change this to daily. And I'll say midnight. And I want to give it a new definition source. Instead of EP old, I'll go to EP new. That's actually newer, not new, but newer than the old one. And just to clean it up, I'll get rid of the old one. So this creates a new policy. Now I have to deploy that policy, so I'll go ahead and say deploy to my clients. Let's take my collection of clients. Now I'm going to wait for policy provider log file to update. It's 11.33, just updated once. And you see the time is a little, or size is 720. It may update a couple different times, but um, that tells us the policy has been created to deploy this out to my client computers. So now, before I do anything else, let's go to the client computer. And he's still searching. Uh, he's not done his update yet. Um, to say he's got a old definition. He's still in the process of trying to find the current definition. Um, so where he should be looking if the initial policy got implemented, it's red and exit is software policies, Microsoft, Microsoft anti-malware, signatures, and there you can see the policy source is the old location, primary one, EP old. So he's looking for definitions there to try and download. And it gives you this the order. The order tells you the order which the different policies have. And I turned off everything except for the <coughs> shares. Normally, have configuration manager, which means go find the definitions for config man VP and go ahead and implement them. And again, I turned that off. So this is a good change and get the new policy down for a client computer. So I was hoping this guy would go ahead and, uh, yeah, since, uh, I don't know why he says connection failed, but uh, let's go verify. I know I can talk to pull the policy. Uh, but anyway, uh, see in your client, it says Saturday at 2 a.m. We're going to go ahead and fix this. So how we're going to fix this is go to our site server, and one of the new things we have in Service Pack 1 is real-time actions. 
So I created this custom policy. I told it to deploy to the collection clients. Remember, I went out to the, each client computer. I went to the control panel, configuration manager, actions, machine policy, and did an initiate action on each of those. You don't have to do that anymore. So go to your collection of clients, in this case, the big manager clients. Go up here on the ribbon. You have this new ribbon action called download computer policies. This is a real-time, immediate, do this right now type thing. So I'll go ahead and kick this off on my collection of clients. And it says, hey, you've got three computers in that collection. They're going to be notified of this thing, and they're going to go ahead and some work. So I'll say, okay, you do that. Go back over and have our client up and running while I go draw something on the whiteboard. And so what should happen now is when you start up service pack one clients, your client computer, site server, your client computer establishes a TCP connection by default over port 10.1.23 to your MP at startup. And the client's then listening on that TCP connection for commands from the site server. So your admin up at the site server, he does some sort of command, like this case I said to uh, download computer policies. That actually pushes that command. Normally, we put it in the SQL database. Next time the client pulls policies, go to the MP, the MP go check SQL. Hey, here's a new definition for you. In this case, here's a policy to download. We do that. Now, we directly push that from the site server through the MP, directly down to this client in real time. So we kick things off in real time now on clients. So what should have happened is now when I refresh, this has changed from Saturday around 2 a.m. to daily around midnight as far as a Scan schedule because of policy set. Uh, Does the console show uh, the progress of those notifications? Yes, it does. You'll see that momentarily. <coughs> so you can see it changed that. So it went from Saturday at 2 a.m. to a daily at midnight. And our registry now has changed when I hit refresh in the registry to a new signature location. It switched from EP old to EP new. You get signature files. So assuming that primary one is spelled correctly, so it should work fine. So now I gave it policy, and that's what that one actually said, just download computer policies. Not user policies, only computer policies. And that policy said to change these two things. Now what I want to do is I'll go ahead and tell it to download definitions. So go back as a real-time action. I'll go back to that collection. Go to endpoint protection. I'll say download definition. And now you can see that this allows you to force the scanning of software, evaluation of software update deployments. So it's been on a patch job. And by default, we randomly pick some time over the next two hours for the client to evaluate the patches there to, and then go find the DP to pull patches from. Um, that caused problems in RTM because oftentimes you guys would have an hour patch window, maintenance window, and we're randomly picking some time past an hour. So we'd always miss your maintenance window. So we actually disable that by default in SP1, but you can implement that again here on individual deployments if you want to. I don't want to do software update stuff. I want to do endpoint protection. And I don't want to do a two hour randomized time. That could be the end of our day. So I'll say zero, which forces to work right now. So what that's going to do is send that command down to the client to, you know where to find definitions. Don't wait for your schedule time to do so. Go find definitions right now. And it should download them and implement a new uh, schedule. So how you track this, you go to the monitoring workspace, you get this new node in SP1 called Client Operations. So you go to the Client Operations node, and then we give you the commands that you've issued as what we call real-time actions. And here are the two that we've issued so far. Download computer policy, right now it's got no stats. I just have to summarize it, so I'll say run summarization. Give that a moment to think, and then it should come back and say, when I refresh, it should come back and say, Client 3, Success 2, Fail zero offline one. That's what it should say. I'm going to go ahead and re get refresh and see if I got summarization completed yet. Uh, there we go. Okay, so the clients in the question three, two successfully implemented the policy, one's offline. I have three computers in my collection, and one of them, the image is not turned on. So it's an offline client. So what should be happening on our client computer. Uh, now you can see it's got a definition. And this one is 91 days old as opposed to 155. 
So it was told where to go get the definition. All right, the previous policy, this new one, action said to go download definitions right now. By default, it's like 8 a.m. and checks for definitions or whatever time it is. Every eight hours it checks. I said to go force it right now. So that's real-time action forcing things to happen on our client computer. So the download computer policy now, so it doesn't have to be able to ping the machine anymore? Like in the, like on, on uh, SEK 2007? Is your career in the right? If it's unable to ping it, it, it can't update the computer policy? We never do a ping in Okay. We, we've not ping. done ping since... Um, we used to back with the old, oh, Config Man 2007, R2 and R3 had the client status reporting tool. With there, we did have, yeah, we did have the ping, it implemented that, but that was just to say whether it was an active computer or not. If we couldn't ping it on the wire, um, then okay, we'd report back the computer's not online. But that wouldn't prevent us from doing anything else. I think Brian's referring to the right click tool. There's a third yeah, might be. Okay, that, that's third party stuff, I can't tell you what they do. Okay. okay. So sorry. So sure. <laughs> well, my, my clients, all, all, my, all my clients are, are internet facing, so they're on private land. So, <coughs> so you have to figure it out. What you have to be able to do is the client has to have a real time connection to its management point, okay. and then we reach through that management point directly to that client to the, over that TCP port and poke it. Okay. So we're basically poking the client directly from the site server. Okay. Yeah, it's going through the management point. But okay. So now let's go further with endpoint protection. Um, Let's go ahead and on my client computer here, I have a folder called malware files. And what's going to happen here, these, these are industry standard malware called ICAR. You can download and test it out yourself if you want to. When I go ahead and start trying to access test one, these five files are all the same. I get access denied. And then momentarily, way down here in the system tray, or above the system tray, you'll get a green balloon pops up says, hey, we detected some malware, we're going to go ahead and clean it out automatically. We don't do it immediately. There's some sort of a rule that we have to wait a period of time to let the end user do something on their own before we do something. So any second now, that should pop up, and then test one will go away because it'll be quarantined. Any second now, that's going to pop up and test, oh, there we go, okay. There it goes, and test one should get removed. As soon as the balloon goes away, test one's gone, and now we've quarantined that file. And if I go ahead and pick any of the other files, the exact same thing would happen. But now we go through quicker because we've already given the end user time once to do, they did it on their own, so we're going to take care of it on our own. So, all right, that generates the malware. And then test two goes away. There we go. Okay. All right, that's your standard anti, that's your standard our endpoint protection stuff. So now we send that back to the endpoint protection dashboard. So in the endpoint protection dashboard, uh, we show you the status of your environment. And we've not done any summarization yet, so this is all empty right now. You can see it says summary, summarization data not available. We have a summarize since we enabled endpoint protections like every 20 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and force summarization and give that a moment to process the data that's in the database. And it will come back and give us our current date and time, which should say around 11.43, 53, whatever it is. And then give us the number of clients in our collection, three. And how many clients are at risk, two. And then um, if we've got the malware data back, we'll say we've got malware that's occurred. Okay, so 114408. We have three computers in our collection. Two of them are at risk. One of the computers is inactive. So if you, uh, if you had not um, installed the input protection on any of those, you'd find out. If the configuration manager client wasn't installed, you'd find out. Clients in that collection. Here's a malware event that's occurred. I'll come back to that in just a second. I can see how many clients have old definitions. So current definitions up to three days old, up to seven days old, old ones and stuff, which I have both, both of mine. And then if you had any clients that aren't protected right now, because they have not had a restart since the hotfix was applied, you'd know that as well. I have five clients where we had to install the 899, 891, 899, whatever it was, hotfix never rebooted yet. If we suppressed it, you'd find out those. Okay, so we scroll back up here. The point about, well, who's got old definitions? I can click this as a hyperlink. Click it. It will create what we call a temporary a sticky node, a kind of a temporary collection. And it will show you the computers that fall in that category. Endpoint protection specific details there. And if you go down below, we'll tell you the deployment information about the client. If you go to your, uh, you can look at malware details, you can look at status down here for your policies. We'll show you a lot of details on there uh, for your 
uh, and for protection environment. You said that was a temporary collection? Yes. It's not really a collection. Oh, you know, um, so we just kind of refer to it as a collection. It's not there to go look at collections. Okay. You won't see it. Uh, it's not created one. It just creates this temporary query to show the results. Can you create a collection based off term? A force action call? Uh, if you wish to do so. Okay. Yeah, from well, that's open the database, so there's not a right click create collection here. Okay. Uh, actually, to do that. Because you can close the node, but I don't want to see that node anymore, and get rid of it. But go back here. Now, this malware, this is also hyperlinked. Who got affected for infection? Uh, click one, click that one. It's showing client one, and it will show me the appropriate information for him, what anti malware policies apply to it. It's got two of them. And malware detail. I'll see what the malware was where it occurred, the date and time, and so on, what happened with the files that got uh, hit on my client. Now, in Service Pack 1, we give you this new dashboard. That's all the same thing you have in RTM. In SP1, we have this new dashboard called Malware Detected. It's a malware-centric view of what's going on. So now you see the collection that got impacted, what file was or threat we found, how many clients were in the collection, how many were infected and remediated, um, how many clients are total infected. I click view clients here. And that will go ahead and show me again that same view that we had earlier. And I go down to files modified. Oh, wow, test1.txt, that wasn't really a virus. That's a false positive. We blocked something so we didn't have a definition for it. So I really want to allow that to happen. So what I can do here is I can take this um, file or this malware, if I want that, the malware itself, I can go ahead and say allow this threat. And it says, hey, okay, we're going to go ahead and create a basically a policy that says you can go ahead and allow this threat to run in the future. No longer block this uh, from occurring. So you can do that. You can also do a restore files quarantine. If I do that, it says, okay, restore files without a dependency. We're going to do a dependency on the allow threat. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, go ahead and say allow this threat. That's a real-time action. They'll get pushed down to the client computer. And then I'll say, oh, well, if I want to allow that thread, I probably need to get those files back. I got deleted, and it was an executable that we blocked. You need the file back, so I want to restore those files. And those become, again, real-time actions. They go to the client operations node, and I can go ahead and track those. So here's the allow thread. Here's the restored quarantine file. And I can do summarization to find out what my status is. Well, would you have to initiate policy on that? Or would you? <coughs> that is real-time action. So. What should happen here, within moments, my um, test, <coughs> test class reappear here. So it should appear, reappear here, and then I would be allowed to go ahead and run any of these. Like right now, if I try and run test 5, it's blocked. Because it hasn't received a real-time action yet to, oh, there, oh, that's a, that's a quarantining. So test 5 can go away. And momentarily here, <coughs> boy, there we go. and then test 1, 2, and 5 should come back through the restore quarantine files. And then once they come back, the policy's down there to tell it to go ahead and um, allow the threat to occur in the future. So you can launch off any one of those five files. No, they go, they're five are back now. That's file specific, right? If there's uh, multiple files that uh, show the same tendency or the same trait, you have to do it for each one of the files, right? Well, no, that's just for, if you want to restore those files, yes. Right. Yes, but if you just want to allow the threat, then it's obviously the same threat to the multiple files. So now I can go ahead and run any of these like I never ran test three before, and now it pops there. You can see what the ICAR command is to be the um, malware. Um, so this shows you the real time actions that force things to happen on your client computers in an immediate time frame. Uh, so right now we have download computer policies, not machine policies. We have these endpoint protection actions uh, that I showed you a couple of them here. We had so we had the allow threat. Oops, come back down here. So we had the allow threat, restore quarantine files. We have those as real-time actions. You go over here. Then on the oops, then you have these three: run full scan, run quick scan, or download definitions. Those are all the real-time actions. We don't have to got hardware inventory. We don't have RBDDR. All those other right-click tools that you guys have from your third parties. We don't have those yet. But we obviously now have the infrastructure to do so. So you might expect in any subsequent release, you might see additional actions coming out from us to help you manage your clients a little more effectively. And then obviously the software updates. So a patch came out, one of those 
out-of-band patch releases from us, and it's really important you want to get that out right away, you can go ahead and deploy your patch and then do that right-click and summarize right now. Uh, basically, do the instead of um, doing your um, deadline stuff, or um, yeah, doing your deadline stuff. What Windows clients are supported by Info Protection? Windows embedded and later, so all of our clients. We also do have endpoint protection for Macs and Linux clients, but it doesn't integrate with those. It's a completely separate product. We just call it endpoint protection, but it gives you the virus and malware protection. It's not integrated here for management. <coughs> now, for service one, we did change this randomization thing. So for your deadline deployments, if you go to default client settings, you go to computer policy, oops, computer agent, sorry, computer agent, and go down to the very bottom, you see disable deadline randomization is yes. And that's that two hour random time period we'll get a deadline before we evaluate so that clients will randomly pick some time so you spread out your network load. So not all clients are downloading your 15 patches at the same time for your DPs. So, and again, we disable that now. In RTM, you couldn't because of the fact that we would miss your patch windows, your bandwidth windows, because of the two hour randomization, which you couldn't control. So now you can disable it and you can implement it if you want to on that. Um, I sure it's in one dialogue. So that's the real time actions. The only other thing there is, again, you can, um, you can change the um, port if you wish to. If you need to change the port for real time actions, then you go up to your ports on your site, and it's this client notification port. This guy right here. <coughs> and again, default to 10.123. So you can change that port if you want to. So what your clients initially try and do is to establish this connection over that port, over TCP. If that port's blocked by firewall, then we back off to HTTP, and we go over whatever port you're using for HTTP. And you can't have that blocked, otherwise your client's dead, because we need HTTP for our normal client functionality. So it would be whatever your 80 or 443, depending on what protocol you're using there. Now, just if you want to track this, um, or you've seen this, if you played around with SP1, um, if you go look at your site server, this is implemented through something called BGB. So if you see any log files here that start with BGB on their name, those log files right there, that's the server end of this client notification feature. Um, BGB is the code name for the big green button. So basically the go button. Um, so make it go right now, so it's the big green button. So. so you would see in here the one you'd be interested in would be BGB server. And you'd go look at the very bottom of it. And it tells you, in this case, uh, so here's total online clients, two that are TCP based, none are HTTP, so firewalls available on everybody, not blocked. Um, I've sent out some tasks here to two clients to tell you about your task ID and so on. So it tells you how many clients are, um, are online in your environment and when you send out tasks to your clients and how many clients they were sent to. And then on the client end of things, I know I could, use, I could use the site server as well as the client, but it's just cleaner looking at the directory. That's for me, I'm not available. Uh, CCM logs. It's the CCM notification agent log file. So we changed the name to something a little more logical on the client end. We didn't change the server end. And if you go look at the bottom of that log file, I know everybody else in the world uses SMS trace or CM trace. I don't. Trace 32. Trace 32, yeah, whatever you want to call it. They all stink. No, it's a great tool. Uh, I just don't like it. So. so here it tells you both TCP and HTTP are enabled. We're going to try TCP first. We're able to connect to the server over the IP address and the port. It was successful, so we're good. We're communicating over TCP. And then here are some tasks. Here's a task that we received from the computer from the BGB server. So it's directly sent from the site server all the way down to the MP over the TCP connection and implemented on the client computer in real time. This is designed to support your large environments of 100,000 clients. So it is designed for that. Uh, we don't want you to go out there and download computer policy, download computer policy, download computer policy in all systems all the time. Uh, but you can do so. Uh, we do allow you in the app and console, last thing before I move on, is you go into your monitoring node where you have all these actions, and once you've got things that are cleaned up, you go ahead and say, okay, I don't need this one anymore, 
that one. You go ahead and delete it to clean up your console. Um, there's no, there's no um, current capability to find out, okay, well, who failed and who's offline, who's unknown? You can't track that. Other than looking at other reports for, hey, this is a software distribution job or a patch job, who's not compliant? You can see it that way, but you can't see who's offline and so on. Um, that's a common request is to get some of the reporting in there and we're looking into that, but um, as of right now, I'm not capable of doing that. Okay, so that's real-time action. One of the, one of, actually, one of the coolest features, things we added to SP1 is even that real-time capabilities of administering the clients. So, well, a question on that. Yeah. Could, could we use the, the SDK to, to invoke that automatically, the client notification? That is the theory, that you can use the SDK to do the same stuff. And so, yes. could we send different computer schedules? Um, machine policy. Again, there, there's a theory that you should be able to do your own stuff along with that framework that we've already got set there. Yes. Now, we do have a, um, this is not where I was going, but that's fine, it got brought up. It's not really, you mentioned SDK. We do have PowerShell in, in Service Pack 1 now. We support it in RTM, but we didn't give you a whole lot of samples. We gave you like a handful in the SDK. Now in Service Pack 1, we have our own PowerShell provider that's going to pop up here any second now. It is going to pop up here any second now. The power must be a lot slower than um, other power in the United States. There we go. So we got our command prompt. It shows um, PS for PowerShell and then our site code. And then you just go run whatever your command. And I am not a PowerShell guy at all. I can't even spell API a little and use one. So um, I know enough to type in get dash command dash module configuration manager, and then let that thing run. So there, that's what you can do with PowerShell. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's about what you're going to get out of me out of it. Um, and our PM that owns PowerShell, um, and again, I think it's 472 commandments we have now in Service Pack 1 from the handful we had in RTM. But the, the PM that, um, uh, that owned PowerShell, he actually sent me an email that had a a long command line with a bunch of parameters in there you put that would, that would break these up by um, bucket areas, like boundaries, boundary groups, and all the actions, you know, the gets, the sets, the updates, the removes, the news, and stuff. And then pipe it to more so you can um, print it out and whatever you want to do and just paste through it. Um, and I'll just go look at that command line, I don't remember all the syntax, but um, there's capability there. So here's a whole bunch of stuff for importing. So if you want to import things, you want to export from your lab environment and import them into the production environment. So we have ex export commands, we have import commands. Um, creating gets is uh, obviously retrieving stuff. You have invokes, making active, install it, configuration in the client to be like a push process. Um, new, um, so create a new application. So you can do something like uh, uh, get dash cm boundary. And that they will return for you the appropriate boundaries that you have in your environment. Give you all the basic information for them. Uh, and obviously there's, there's sets and gets and news and ads and <coughs> all those kind of other things that you do with scripting stuff. Our goal is that anything you can do in our admin console, you can invoke through a PowerShell command line. Uh, we didn't quite make it with SP1. There's still a few things missing, but we're uh, pretty darn close. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but for, I would guess from what I'm hearing, we're probably 98% complete as far as actions you can do from the console that you can now do with PowerShell, uh, through a PowerShell provider. So we're really there, and our, and our um, SDK that just got released for Service Pack 1 a couple of weeks ago, um, it's supposed to have some good documentation there for you. So, so if you're a PowerShell type dude or do this, um, great. Uh, play around to your heart's content. Just leave me alone. Um, <laughs> keep me out of it. <laughs> now the problem, I was at a conference in, in Oslo a couple weeks ago, the Nordic Infrastructure Conference. And the keynote speaker there was Jeffrey Snover, who if you know, he's the godfather of PowerShell. So he's there the entire week, two days of the conference, and a day beforehand with me, just talking PowerShell. And went over my head, uh, didn't understand a word he said. In fact, I created it. Uh, so I, I understood that part of it. So, but, uh, very cool. All right. Uh, so where I want to go next is some quick software distribution stuff for you. So let's go to, I installed the application catalog roles. Let's go ahead and what I wanted to show you is the new app v5 stuff that we have in, in Big Man 2012 SP1. So I'm going to go to an application, I'm going to create a new application. 
And we have two different versions of AppB we support now with SP1. We have AppB 4.6 and we have AppB 5. And they're not the same format files. They don't interoperate at all together. But you can create and deploy applications based on sequence versions of both those. So if I go down here, you'll see I have, oops, I go there, sorry, AppV4. This Microsoft AppV4 is what you guys have in your RTM build, just listed as Microsoft Application Virtualization. We only had one version back then, so we didn't give it a version number. So same thing as you guys have today, we just put the four on the end of it, because the next one down below is the Microsoft Application Virtualization 5 for version 5.0. So I'm going to create first an AppV4 app, uh, primary one, oops, what did I do? Oh. Lab files, rich copy, virtual app. Now for an AppV4 app, when you import it, you actually import the manifest XML file. So you take your AppV4.6 sequencer, you still get your application, it's got a whole bunch of files for you and you browse to the manifest XML file. That's your import source for an AppV4 app. Okay. So I'll import him. Create my app. I'll just call it rich copy from Microsoft. And we'll go ahead and create our app. Okay, so I'll do that. <coughs> now we also have in Service Pack 1, we have support for AppV5. And again, AppV5 is not the same file formats. We'll see that momentarily here. Let's go create application. And now we'll go here, we'll create AppV5. There we go, AppV5. So primary one, lab files, and I'll take office. And now you see what you browse and import is the .appv file. So that's your source now for an AppV5 application. So they are sequenced differently. So you can't import and deploy an AppV4 sequence app with AppV5 and vice versa. Now the MDoc team did write a converter that can convert AppV4.6 sequence apps over to AppV5 formats. So you can do that if you wish to. I'll just go ahead and import that. And we'll create this app. Uh, we'll go ahead and delete Microsoft in there. We'll put it down here in Publisher. And I'm going to create the AppV5 app. And I'm going to create one more. And this will be another AppV5 app. And this is going to be Visio. Files. Visio. AppV. And. Okay. So I've got a. At v, one at v4 and two at v5 apps. And if you verify that, just go to deployment types and you'll see at v5, at v4, and then at v5 again is the technology. Now, realistically, what you do is you go in there and configure your dependencies. So my at v4 app would be dependent upon the at v4 client agent being installed. And my at v5 would be dependent upon the at v5 client agent being installed. And you configure your requirements. Primary device equals true, memory, disk space, um, whatever else you want to have. I'm just going to skip all that just because of the time we have here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and take these four pieces of content. I'm going to go and distribute them to my VP because the office ones are a little bit larger, uh, quite a bit larger. I'll go add them to my distribution point. Now I have one, but whenever we show you VP now with SD1, we tell you whether it's on premise or cloud based, so you know whether to put the content there or not, which VP you can select. And we'll go ahead and let that content get distributed. Now, let's go see if our client can connect to the application catalog. Let's start in the floor. And we'll stop the default one. And we'll go to HTTP, binary one, CM application catalog. Oops. And that should go ahead and connect this up to the application catalog. If you're not played around with it, this is the new portal we have for end user targeted software distribution. So end users can go to the Internet Explorer website with SQ1 we support additional browsers other than IE. And it shows you in the upper right 
who you're logged on as. It tells me I'm logged on as Big Ben Dom Administrator. Lower left, it gives you your company branding. In this case, Eastern Area System Benjamin User Group. And then it'll show you all the applications you have in the appropriate color scheme. Remember, I picked pink for you, um, two Suttonians. Uh, so I am able to get to the application catalog. That's fine. Uh, now our content should be distributed to our distribution point. Let's go verify that. Status. And you can see my three applications here all are 100% distributed. And you can see the, um, the offices and Gizio look larger than my rich copy ones. So they take them longer to install. So now let's go ahead and make this rich copy application. Let's go ahead and deploy it. Oops, I want to deploy the user. I forgot to do, uh, yeah, I want to cancel. I forgot to do user discovery. You guys forgot to remind me to do that. We need to do user discovery. We're going to deploy the users. So enable active director user discovery. We enable, we go to our root of our forest and we just find all users you can find. Then take everything, run that discovery method. Okay. It'll populate that um, collection momentarily. So now let's go back to rich copy and deploy it. We're going to go to all users. It says zero members here. That will update here shortly. And it's going to warn me saying, hey, you know your collection has zero members in it. And so it tells me it doesn't pay any members. I know. It's in the process of updating it, so that's fine. And our content started in our DP. We're going to make this available as an install. So it'll be in the application catalog. We don't have to worry about scheduling, user experience, or anything else. Go ahead and deploy Office. Exact same way. And install available. And just to show you it's going to work, I'll go over here to Asset Compliance, Users. There's my six users that discovered. Now if I go to my user collections, and tell it to update this collection membership, which it will do on its own. I'm just going to force it right now. Um, it should go ahead and in my next time I deploy this software in Visio, hopefully it will tell me that I have six members of that collection. If it's done processing a collection already. Hasn't yet. Uh, but it will pop up here and say six momentarily. And do the same thing for that guy. Okay. Now I have to go back over here and use your collections. Okay, so it's updated that one now. It has to update the parent collection first. You can see that um, all users is dependent upon or limited to all users and user groups. So that's to update this one first, and then we'll go ahead and update this one probably right now. Not yet. Any moment now, it should. Uh, Members. Any yeah, so moment the collection membership there? I already did that. I already did the update collection membership on the all users. So it forces the parent collection to be updated first and then it updates the one I want. Um, and it's probably any, I keep saying any second now, but um, obviously these seconds are longer and, and I'm used to them. But I did do an update collection membership on this guy, so. Did uh, the discovery finish? Yeah, otherwise I wouldn't have anything in, in this one. This one was empty as well. So it's all the same. So I don't have any user groups that got discovered. So I know it, it's just taking its own sweet time to get there. But until I do that, since I targeted all users, I can't um, see my software. Okay, I'll go force him again. Unless I did just pick the wrong one um, accidentally. And when I was trying to do the all users, I thought I did all users. And now we. Come on. It's so exciting watching pink dry. There we go. Now we got our users in there and go here and they're all popular in all users. So. Um, luckily, normally when you guys do stuff, you're not just looking for instantaneous gratification when you're doing stuff in the console. You're creating stuff and it's going to happen overnight or you then go to lunch break or whatever. Uh, we're just obviously are short on time, so we're forcing things to happen um, in a shorter time frame. All right. so. Back to our client. Now, if we refresh the catalog, we should see three applications available to us. And 
of the application should be refreshing, application catalog refreshing, and it should get three applications there, the rich copy, app v4, office 2007, and busy 2007 based on app v5. So if I want to take, I'll take the app v4 one first, that's what you're familiar with. I'll go ahead and click install. And I say, I'm not sure. I say, yes, I do want to. And preparing, evaluating, any requirements that we need for agencies and detection methods and requirement rules.